So this video is on the science of embodiment. Happily now, there's a pretty good evidence base developing for the idea the body is more than just a, a machine that moves us around, for the idea that we're not just heads on sticks. There's a Western scientific basis for what may have been understood intuitively or that was common in kind of Eastern systems, now, now has some science behind it. So that's what I'm gonna present here. First of all, it's apparent that the mind affects the body. This has been known for a long time. You know, you can hypnotize people and have their, their arm go numb, for example, and move in a certain way. Uh, the idea of what was called psychosomatic illness is now called medically unexplained symptoms. This is a really strong effect that doctors see all the time. Um, related to this is the placebo effect, the idea you can give someone a pill that has nothing but sugar in or inert chemicals, and it have a really strong medical effect if they think that it's a medicine. Um, this is why we have double blind medical st studies to actually control for placebo, because uh, it's an incredibly strong thing. So the idea that the mind affects the body, that I think no one would argue that, even the most mainstream science, no one would argue that. And we also now have the idea more related to embodiment, the body affects the mind. So the pers first person to talk about this was William James, uh, and something called the James Lange theory of emotion. Now the idea that when we have an emotional reaction, the body's involved is apparent and measurable, you know, heart rate, adrenaline levels, those sort of things. My shoulders might come up, whatever it is. Um, and what he first said was that it's when you have a physical response that leads to an emotion, not just the emotion that leads to the physical response. And these various people like Sashita and Singer did clever experiments where they injected people with adrenaline and then saw they had some kind of an emotional response based on, based on that, not knowing that they'd been injected with adrenaline. So the body has been seen to influence emotion strongly and there's lots more kind of modern studies around that. So William James said, if you want to have a quality, act as if you already do. Method actors experience this when they really get into a character, they stay in that character, they're embodying that character. The, the difference between acting and embodiment breaks down at that point. There's even been a number of instances of actors falling in love after having played characters who are in love. So one of the best summaries of this of related research is from Professor Richard Wiseman. He's at the University of Hertfordshire, just north of London. They do some really good work up there, lots of interesting psychologists there. Uh, his book, Rip It Up, he calls this acting as if. And many of the studies I'm now gonna cite actually come from him and his book. Another modern study looking at emotion, for example, uh, is where they ask people to hold a pen in their teeth. And that forces you to smile, basically. And what they found is people that did that uh, actually ended up being happier. Uh, more generally, there's studies on walking style, on handshaking style, um, showing that personality as well as emotion is linked to those styles. You can change people's mood for asking them to have a different style of handshaking, also changing their impact and influence on other people. So we've got emotion personally, you've got the link to personality, uh, and you've got also how that comes across to people. If you shake hands in particular way, certain movement styles, you'll be perceived as more warm or more cold, depending on that. Look up Sarah Snodgrass and Sabine Koch if you want some more information on that. There's all kinds of studies in this area, like people that washed their hands after doing something a bit naughty felt less guilty. Uh, incredible finding, really. Also, how people think. So I mentioned the Nintendo Wii board in another video about how if you rock backwards and forwards, it enables you to see two sides of, a, of an argument much easier. We have the dance doctor also in the UK. He found that asking people to move in certain ways made them more creative if you moved in a more kind of flowing, unpredictable way. And it could be actually more disciplined, better at checking things if you moved in a more predictable, linear kind of way. So the way we move actually affects how we think. Um, more generally, we can call this embodied cognition. Very popular theory actually in robotics as well, where they've, they've worked out trying to make robots more human-like, that actually their interaction with the environment, the feedback from having different sensors, like a proto-body, if you will, is actually absolutely necessary for making these robots think in a human-like way. So there's a very practical application there. Other things people have found, like sitting in hard chairs versus soft chairs, makes a difference between how people are in negotiation. Uh, another great study asked people to hold a warm mug, and it made them feel warmer, but also assess other people as warmer. So it made them think that the world was a friendlier place. We associate warmth uh, with emotional warmth. This is pretty universal, because often we're held as babies, there's a sense of closeness with other people. Um, look up Lakoff and Johnson on this work, the idea of the metaphors we have for the world and how they're embodied metaphors, this embodied cognition idea again. So from, from that kind of philosophical viewpoint, 
that's associated with phenomenology and other kinds of philosophies, it's actually when we start seeing these studies from science about, say, the MUG or the Wii board, it's actually not so surprising. And when anyone that's trained in embodiment looks, hears about these studies, they just nod and go, great, you know, the scientists are finally catching up. Someone else who's become very well known, great TED talk, is Amy Cuddy. Uh, her and her colleagues have found that what's called power postures, so more expansive kind of postures, actually change the levels of hormones in the body, changing levels of testosterone and cortisol. And these are mediating how confident people feel, but also how confident they're assessed, for example, in job interviews. They found that taking on these kind of dominant power postures um, change the levels that are measurable of these hormones in saliva and also change people's performance in real practical things like job interviews. So again, this is the kind of practical application of scientists rediscovering this area of embodiment. Then there's all the neuroscience research. So I recommend Mandy Blake's paper on this. She's got a book coming out. Um, to summarise some of it, we learn in different ways, for example. So a lot of embodiment's about implicit learning. The idea our whole system learns something. Um, you know, have you ever forgotten your, your password for the ATM, the hole in the wall, the cash, and you go there and you can't remember, but then as soon as you're at the machine, your body knows it, yeah, it's there, oh, and you type it in, yeah? Similarly, how we relate, how we lead, uh, how we connect with other people, these aren't just facts that we know, yeah, like we've read the books, but Wikipedia isn't solving the world's problems, it's not just information. There's a, there's a skill acquisition which from an embodiment actually turns into being. Um, neuroscience evidence for this, also in terms of um, how we respond to stress, how the amygdala hijacks our neocortex, how our neocortex gets turned off, kind of basal side of the brain, how the kind of lizard brain, mammalian brain is really taking over uh, under pressure when we're pumped full of adrenaline, making us less smart, less rational, and how techniques like centering relaxation techniques can help us get the smart part of ourselves back so we can operate most effectively. Um, also in terms of relationships, so it's really established now in neuroscience that we're, we're wired to connect. Yeah? So embodied practicing involving other people is really important. We're hardwired to be in relationship with other people, so that's another area that applies to embodied training. So I can now point to scientific validation for the fact that the body is intimately involved with perception, how we see the world, cognition, our thinking, our social relations, including our impact and influence, and of course our emotions. All these aspects have now been proven to be deeply interconnected with the body, and that, that's embodiment. We're starting to look at the 12 functions of the body there. Another strand of science that's worth looking at is, is the work around trauma. So because the trauma is so involved with the body, this is one of the first areas of therapy to really uh, take the body seriously. People like Peter Levine, Babette Rothschild, uh, Pat Ogden, a number of trauma therapists working with the body and looking at the research around fight and flight, those kind of things, providing evidence base for the connection between emotion and also attachment, how we, how we connect with other people and the body. I think there's a comparison here with the world of mindfulness. So people like John Kabat-Zinn took meditation, these Eastern practices, they put them in a more scientific format, they then found evidence base for it showing that you know, it could be used for depression or anxiety, for example. I now see a similar movement happening within the embodiment world where we're getting more rigorous and we're starting to ask, okay, how does this apply to the science? And uh, for me, the connections are strong and, are strong and becoming even stronger.